Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening is available on Amazon Music for all the music plus top podcasts included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Start listening by downloading the Amazon Music app for free or go to amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Super real. Hey, I'm Julian Morgans, and you're listening to What It Was Like, the show that asks people who have lived through big, dramatic events what it was like. So I think I might have mentioned on a previous episode that I used to work at Vice, which used to be a media company. They announced bankruptcy last year, and then they shut down their site last month. So it's all over. And I've been feeling a little nostalgic about that. I was there for almost 10 years, and and we ran some really fun stories. And I think of all of them, there's this one that stands out to me. It's this thing I've been thinking about. It's a guy, actually. This guy I met back in 2014. And his name's Matt Bowden. And he basically pioneered an industry of alternative drugs. And what that means is that if you were living in New Zealand between 2000 and 2008, you could legally buy these things called party pills over the counter. And they had a similar effect to an illegal drug like speed or MDMA. Now, this was in New Zealand, but let's just go broadly for a minute. So you might remember a similar period, like 2010s, where tobacco stores and like dodgy corner stores that sell like bongs and stuff, they started selling things like synthetic weed and imitation speed called bath salts. And the backstory to where those drugs came from, like where those chemicals originated, is that a lot of them had been created by pharmaceutical companies throughout the 20th century. So let's say that in the 70s, for example, maybe a drug company had been trialing a particular chemical, a particular molecule, um, but they dismissed it because it didn't have whatever therapeutic effects that they'd originally been looking for. But this chemical, it had never been made illegal because it had never been produced on sufficient scale to be a problem. So Matt was one of the first people anywhere in the world to make this leap of imagination and go, hey, let's go through all of these old medical journals and look for stimulants, like non-lethal, unscheduled stimulants that we could rebrand and sell to partygoers. This was the light bulb moment that led to a bit of a revolution in the global drug market, and it all started in New Zealand. Now, I should point out that Matt isn't the kind of money-hungry opportunist that, that he might sound. I'd say he's actually uh, kind of a whimsical soul. And it was something that drew me to him when we first met. But what really excites me about this story is how Matt lives. Matt lives big, possibly the biggest I've seen. When I met him, Matt had rebranded himself as a steampunk rocker named Starboy. And he was touring the world playing shows and, and making video clips. He'd even shot this mini movie trilogy called Starboy Eternity. And it's epic, to say the least. And just so you know what I mean, here's a clip. Did you hear that explosion at the end there? That was Matt blowing up a, an airship with pink electricity. And you know what? I love these videos. I love that he didn't spend his millions on Lamborghinis and trips to Vegas, but instead he sunk it into music and these crazy videos. And Matt didn't just sell drugs or shoot video clips. He also lobbied for policy reform, which led New Zealand to do an almost universally unprecedented thing. So in 2011, the government reclassified a range of drugs so they could be regulated and sold in licensed venues. And this is the kind of progressive policy that we're now seeing in places like the US state of Oregon and Portugal in Europe. And yeah, sure, I know Oregon and Portugal, they're both now having second thoughts. But as a kind of policy experiment, New Zealand got there first about a decade earlier. So I know that was a lot, but here's a quick recap. Today's episode is the story of a man who pioneered a new type of drug industry 
then became obscenely rich, then spent a lot of it on making crazy video clips, and then became public enemy number one when New Zealand did a policy reversal and confiscated all of his wealth and property. And to tell you that story, I bring you Matt Bowden. Matt, welcome to the show. Hi, Julianne. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So tell me about your background. Were you born in New Zealand? Yes, I was. I came into this body in 1971 in, um, in West Auckland. Um, went to school and uh, was wanted to be a musician, really, um, but also had a keen interest in sciences. And um, I guess when I was about uh, 28 or 30, the um, pivotal thing for me was we had um, an ecstasy death in the family. Another friend died with crystal meth. And um, that's kind of set me on the path um, that I'm on now. So, so at the point where you have a friend who dies, yeah. what, was, what was happening in your life at that time? I, was, I actually was pretty straight, you know. I, was, um, I went through a long Christian phase. I was the worship leader at church, if you like. Huh. Yeah. So when I'm around 30, I guess, I was um, working in marketing at a car magazine selling advertising. And, but then we had, an, we had an ecstasy death in the family. Um, and New Zealand had only had, there was like the third ecstasy death that we'd had, um, a hyponatremia death, which means the person has too much MDMA and they drink too much water and um, they can't process it and, and, it, and it kills them. And you were, you were pretty close with this family member? Not, not, not really, but close enough that it sort of impacted the family um, because this, you know, it was news. And then another person that I was close to um, commit suicide with um, on methamphetamine, and that mm. was someone that, that, that was a lot closer to me. And um, th- those two events in my life were um, became pillars. And I, so I thought, oh, why, why, why do we not have quality control? You know, I'd been working with car magazines, looking at cars. If cars are too dangerous, then we we have a rule that says you got to put brakes in them, and you got to have seat belts, and you got to have airbags to make them safer. Why aren't we doing the same with the drugs? Um, and so I, so I, I looked at where our laws come from, and I went to uh, Wellington with the parliamenters and said, who's writing the drug laws? Um, look, I'm a grieving family member of the ecstasy death, and this, you know, this other things happened, and why? Why don't we have quality control systems? And the policy team sat me down um, and explained, and they said, Matt, the reason why is that when we've tried to change our laws away from the war on drugs model, um, America have threatened to stop buying our meat and cheese. Um, so we just can't do that. Mm. And I said, well, why don't we find this, some safer alternatives that aren't on America's list and build a quality control system with those? And the team said, well, yeah, that, that, would, that would sort of fit with the policy. And then I just put, started putting together a team of um, scientists, and that's how we got started. So you're making this sound relatively straightforward. Your experience at this time, your, your job at that time was the marketing department of a magazine. So yeah. why did you see yourself as the guy to take on New Zealand's drug laws? Oh, it's, well, as I say, I had, I had quite a spiritual bent, and I felt... Um, I strongly felt called like it was a vocational thing, a, a really strong drive and an incredible self-belief that um, that we could find a better way. Were you still a religious man at this point? Did, was there any sort of hangover from your preaching days? Uh, not, not really religious and... In, in habit or anything, but just a, a, a belief, a solid belief and very spiritual. So in a sense that, that the laws that were there were, it was time for them to go and that if I was to create a new system that um, I would be successful in implementing it. And if I believed in myself, then I could go all the way to the top. Yeah. Okay. So you start talking to politicians mm-hmm. um, and I'm curious, was there did it occur to you that there might be a hell of a uh, a business model in this as well? Yeah, it did. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, but it was kind of a, a mixture of, you know, a young guy in his kind of, um, you know, late 20s, early 30s of, you know, you want to you want to make money and so on. But also there's the opportunity to do something absolutely amazing in your community. And so we... Um, we developed products which we would sell to uh, drug users to use as a safer alternative. That was the big picture. That was the big vision. And we started doing that. Okay. You said that uh, you developed these first products. What were they and how did you develop them? 
Okay, so the first thing is to look at methamphetamine was the problem drug in our country in New Zealand. Um, there's no cocaine because the boat just doesn't stop here and it goes somewhere else to Australia, I think, where all mm. the cocaine gets hoovered up. And so in New Zealand, people are, people were making just crystal meth, uh, which people smoke um, or they might inject, which means that very quickly you have a euphoria and then it fades away and there's a strong sense that you need to have some more and so you redose and you keep doing that every two to three hours that would became the norm in our society more and more people's lives were just falling apart and so we needed a solution to reduce demand for meth and we went to um okay so let's look at the research and see if we can find a drug with a known toxicity which is going to be non-addictive which will substitute for meth in users um and then and then looking, this was about the same time as, um, you know, all of the academic databases and libraries of information were coming online. The internet was coming along. And so we were able to find a, um, a compound which had previously been um, in an antidepressant with known safety, which um, in 1973, the Journal of Clinical, um, European Journal of Clinical Pharmacology was reporting that they'd, someone had given it to addicts and they liked it. But now in the early 2000s with an ICE epidemic of methamphetamine, we thought if there's a drug which is non-addictive with known toxicity, which substitutes for amphetamine, that's probably a good starter. What was the name of this chemical? This was BZP or benzylpapyrazine, and it was an intermediate metabolite, which means that somebody else had designed an antidepressant years before, which was something that turns into BZP inside of you. And so um, we were able to predict roughly what the BZP would do based on that research um, and found okay. this was a good starter. So then do you buy a sample and give it a taste? Yep, essentially, yeah. What was it like? Um, kind of like a happy um, speed um, with a bit of a yuck feeling the next day that you don't want to have any more of. Okay, um, so it's not as addictive. Not as addictive, that's right. So you've you got this product, BZP. Mm -hmm. What do you call it? What does the packaging look like? You know, I'm, I'm sort of interested in the mechanics of starting a business, really, which is, is kind of oh, what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, I'd come from, I'd started out working in telemarketing sales and so on, and I could see how that all worked. People phone an 0800 number and order a product and they get shipped out. And then I'd moved into advertising and, and, and car magazines, making advertisements for people. I knew, I knew a little bit about branding and so on. And so we made it look like a, like a dance party flyer because that's what you know was appropriate and I only really wanted it sold where people were going to buy the glass pipes that they use for smoking their crystal methamphetamine so we just try to le limit it to those places and nightclubs and put an 0800 number on so you can call a number and get it shipped to you okay nice and sorry you what were, what were you calling the the BZP um, Nemesis was the name that we gave it at the time and the generic term was party pills or dance pills okay nice and how did you launch this stuff? Or did you just stock it in these shops and hope for the best? I think I might have bought radio advertising at, to, at the start and magazine advertising and dance kind of um, um, magazines because I knew a bit about magazine advertising. And, and so you were importing this stuff from China. Did you need to go to China to visit factories and, and you know, well, negotiate deals? Well, initially, we're, I think we are getting chemicals from USA and that didn't work. And so India is where we went because India was where all the pharmaceutical companies were getting their chemicals made. And so we just went there. So, yeah, I went up to India and had a real good look at the plants and met the people and went and met the people in the factories and had a look. Okay. Okay. And all right. So you launched this stuff. You launch uh, Nemesis. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that first first week. How was it received? Well, to start off with, nobody could really believe that something that would be legal would have any effect at all. And so there was this, um, you had to overcome that that yeah. barrier, that belief barrier. I would have been um, sceptical. Absolutely, yeah. But um, if, well, after someone took the pill within about 20 to 25 minutes, that, that belief would um, diminish and they'd realize, hey, I can actually feel this. And then... Um, People people started using it in in preference to methamphetamine. Mm, okay, can I ask what the profit margin was? So let's say let's say it was thirty dollars for a pack of these party pills. How much were you making on that? They were it was, they were really cheap to produce, um, and so there was a lot of profit margin. Half of it went to the retailer. Mm -hmm. I actually wasn't making that much at all because I just I just couldn't really be bothered with all the business side of it. But then what happened was the government were a little bit slow to regulate. 
lots of other companies were copying. Each new marketer that came into the market made the pills a little bit stronger, a little bit cheaper, and went broader with the market. People saw the money you could make. And people that didn't have really anything, people who were very just experienced in marketing wanted to saturate the market. And so what that told us is you need to have some regulations, you need to have a dose limit, and you need to have some standards around the marketing. And so we just sort of lobbied government and said, hey, can you make this stuff law instead of voluntary? Um, okay. Which was the next process, yeah. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. And you kind of became famous in New Zealand at this point. You know, you were, you were the guy who created these drugs. And, and they were, I remember I had friends who went over skiing in Christchurch and they got a bunch of these party pills and everyone was talking about, hey, wow, if you go to New Zealand, you can just buy these wild pills over the counter. And then they partied for days. And I, I was over here in Melbourne, early 20s being like, damn, I got to go to New Zealand. That sounds fun. And you were the, for lack of a better term, you were the kingpin. Tell me about what that meant for you socially, professionally. Well, it was. I mean, it was, um, I guess I sort of, Grew up being someone that wanted to get attention. I was an attention yeah. seeker. Yeah. And suddenly I had way more attention than I was expecting, you know. I mean, um, I had people like National Geographic coming to make a documentary about me like I was a, you know, blue-toed frog or something. And, and Vice come down saying, hey, we want to fly you to China to go and um, and film in, in drug labs. And, and um all the major media, the BBC and people from France and just all over the world flying in to talk to me and that. And I was in all the magazines and so on. Um, and it, I get, I mean, the reality is I had a bit of a midlife crisis and it went to my head a little bit. Um, I thought, hey, now's the time to start doing some glam rock, you know. And um, yeah, but it, and, and then the other thing that happens is that um, you never know the value of, of your anonymity until it's taken away. And so um, on the one side, if I go to a nightclub or I go out to a bar, then every, everybody just wants to talk, everyone wants to buy you drinks, everyone wants to tell you their story. I mean, uh, you also, you mean, you made a fair bit of money. When I visited you in, I think this would have been 2014, you yeah. had amazing properties, you had a lighthouse, you had your own personal lighthouse. I mean, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> bananas. Yeah, now I've just got to be the lighthouse. Yeah, I did. So... <laughs> What happened is that we would sit around this committee table and um, and I'm like this chair of this, I created an industry committee and essentially kind of being a, became a corporate lobbyist trying to just steer the regulations where I wanted them to go. So, hey, we're going we're gonna to change the world. We're going to change the world. Um, but some people around the table were like, um, I'd be like, okay, let's make the products as safe as possible. And some guys were like, well, no, let's try to make as much profit as possible. And so I thought, well, what I need to do is um, not everyone on the committee wants to go the safety route that I do. I need to be the guy that's making the money so that I can um, instruct the lawyers and pay everything myself. And so, um, so yeah, I restructured and built the a factory that was going to be manufacturing everything and set myself up as the supplier and manufacturer. And then, yeah, next minute, then I had millions of dollars rolling in it happened pretty quickly the transition from having your car repossessed to being a multi-millionaire was pretty quick yeah yep yep and so i was just doing things that a new rich person does um I had a wardrobe with thousands of garments i had a recording studio and um, a clothing label and a costume company in case we wanted to have a fancy dress party we could dress everybody and and just, just kind of crazy stuff, some beautiful properties and so on. Mm. And a real unnerving sense that all of it was going to go and disappear. Hey, so we're just going to stop here for a quick ad break, but stick around because we'll be right back with more What It Was Like. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. 
Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening is available on Amazon Music for all the music plus top podcasts included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Start listening by downloading the Amazon Music app for free or go to amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Hey, everyone. I've been on the go recently. Phoenix, Kansas City, Chicago. If you're like me and have a home but aren't always at home, you have an Airbnb. Hosting your home or a spare room is a very practical side hustle. If you live in a big game town, you can Airbnb your place for fans to stay in. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. So when I visited you, you had a, you'd built this kind of like drug lab in a warehouse in Auckland. Um, mm-hmm. And I remember you had this, this really uh, quietly spoken Chinese guy um, who was running the lab. He reminded me of like a high school chemist. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, what were you doing there? Were you, were you trialing new drugs or were you, was that just the factory floor? Well, what were we doing? Looking at um, uh, all the different drugs that were coming out and how they could be modified, what sort of modifications made them safer and less safe, patenting them, thinking, you know, for cannabinoids, you know, what can we use for pain? We started a pharmaceutical company from scratch and, and right. headhunted and found professors and really high-level academics that um, were really skilled to come in and work. And... Got it. Yeah, I remember, I remember visiting you and it was... It was really interesting because I remember you and uh, Hamilton, Hamilton Morris, mm-hmm. hanging out and just talking chemistry and just having fun like a couple of kids over your Bunsen burners and your and your beakers and, and just making mixing stuff up. Um, but then I also remembered that you had a like a like this this massive uh, library of costumes in the room next door. <laughs> so so I don't know. I've, I've still got this photo of myself dressed up as like a as like a christmas tree and you're dressed up in like this bear costume and we're standing in this laboratory and it's one of my favorite photos i i've still got it on facebook somewhere <laughs> <laughs> it was i mean yeah we had a thing about costume costume party and then and um with with um the thing about costume and about clothing is that you can um if you dress somebody up then they have an opportunity to sort of try on a different personality, a different way of being, and it gives people an opportunity to kind of express something else within that maybe they hadn't found or discovered about themselves before. Mm. And um, that's why that's why I love that. That's why I love that whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me, all right, so I'm, I want to hear the story about how you were almost recruited by an Australian bikey gang. Oh, jeez, yeah, so... I started getting emails from uh, all sorts of people um, asking me to work with them. And um, one one group were quite insistent and my accountant called me and said, hey, these these, pe- these people have talked to me and they've got, you know, a lot, all these legitimate businesses and um, they've got, they put me onto their bank manager and they've got tens of millions of dollars and they want you to come and do some research with them. You should just go and talk to them and see what they want, you know. Okay, so I um so I called these people and they asked me, you know, um to do some work to um design something new, and um they had all that money and so I asked them to check with their lawyers what was good and what wasn't and they came back and said everything was kosher, um, and I and I believed them. I was just so so naive and young, you know, and then and um and so I jumped on a plane and and um went to Australia, and um. Um, things were really different with these guys. I know. I noticed what? after a while that that um, you know that they were you know that a lot of them had firearms. What they look like? I mean, I'm just imagining them covered in tats. You know, just giant uh, necklace guys. No, no, no? <laughs> really wealthy um, people with um, really nice sports cars and so on. They um. Um, what? So they put me in a nice apartment and let's start working on some things. I had a, a, f- a friend with me came with me to start designing a, a lab and yeah, they gave me a nice apartment. And then one day, you know, they gave me a car 
And one day I get, I'm just pull out of my car and I'm, I'm looking at, on the street, there's someone looking in the window to my apartment and I walked past them and I heard them say, I'm at apartment three now, there appears to be no activity inside, shall I proceed? And I thought, geez, that sounds, that sounds pretty bad. That sounds like cop talk, you know? And <laughs> I then, know um, cop talk. <laughs> I've seen the movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we started inquiring through a lawyer um, to talk with the police and see what was happening. And... Um, yeah, eventually, yeah, the police sort of came back and said, yeah, that, you've been under surveillance for a while, mate. We, we know every, they knew everything that I'd done, everywhere that I'd gone, everywhere, everything I'd, I'd been under full surveillance. And um, and they said, you know, it looks like, it looks like you don't really know what you're doing. But this, this guy, um, he obviously needs you at the moment, but is he getting you to train someone up already? And I'm like, oh, he is actually, yeah. Yeah, that's because as soon as he doesn't need you, he's just going to pop you. And uh, we're not going to find the body. That's his modus operandi. So, um, yeah, you stick around here. You'll be doing 10 years. You yeah, fuck off back to New Zealand or stick around here and do 10 years is what the police said. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's rough. And then wow. And then I went inside and packed my bags and <laughs> went to the airport and um, came home to New Zealand. That's intense. You're lucky. I mean, you don't need me to say this, but you're lucky that you got out. Okay. Um. So this was uh, that was during the mid 2000s, uh, and I want to jump forward a little bit to 2011 when you convinced New Zealand's parliament to regulate this stuff, and and that was a bit of a world first, right? And um. So so it was so it was pretty exciting. But then it, the wheels started to fall off. You were getting a lot of uh. You know the the right wing part of New Zealand's electorate really wasn't pleased about it. And, and you got some blowback. And talk to me what happened. Yeah. So after the, the party pills had been taken away, we developed actually a really nice ecstasy alternative, which um, people really liked. Us, uh, so, you know, looking at trying to find a less brain damaging form of ecstasy. That got taken off the market. And then synthetic cannabis started to happen in 2006, I think. And by about 2008, 2009, um, that's where the market was going and my chemist said hey there's a lot of different chemicals out there that are going to end up in the market here or we could find safer alternatives and stop that from happening um, and then I rightly or wrongly got involved in discovering as many molecules as we could trying to find the safest ones to try to steer that industry in a safer direction and that um, eventually it started getting blowback and part of it was the fact that we had presented an alternative pathway globally to the war on drugs a safety system and a lot of countries came into um, workshops with New Zealand about how this would work for them and we'd done uh, what's called um, regulatory impact statements which is a big economic analysis of what happens in your country how you can save money with hospitals and and um, justice and law enforcement if you phase out prohibition and move towards regulated supply I didn't do it, my mm -hmm. government did this and a lot of countries were coming in saying, we're going to follow. The UK um, all-party committee said they would follow New Zealand and places in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one country that didn't like it, and it was the United States. I'm surprised. Yeah. Yeah, so I got I got two um, whistleblower communications, one from in my government saying, hey, Matt, we've had some diplomatic communications from the USDEA. There's a letter here. It's kind of a WTF letter. Um, you need to get your affairs in order. I just didn't know what that meant. I thought, oh, mate, I've got millions and millions of dollars and, you know, life's great. I've got a band. I'm touring around playing festivals and having a great time making movies. And um, Anyway, um, it had all gone to my head. And then I got another call. Um, someone called me and said, hey, the liquor guys have had a meeting with the prime minister. Um, you're going to get axed in the election. Then suddenly um, uh, a scientist put out a report saying, um, the ups, pros and cons of this new law what would work against it is if the public could be stirred up against animal testing because we'd said let's do the same safety standards as a medicine let's go the highest safety standards we can and uh, that means animal testing of course and um, and suddenly every town in New Zealand had protests being organised saying that um, my industry the legal high guys want to kill dogs want to kill your dog Matt Bowden wants to kill your dog basically and um and we need to go out and protest. And so every town had these massive protests with all these really coordinated, well-funded placards and all the news crews were there. And it's like, where the hell did that come from? And then um, I don't want to test on dogs. And government put out statements saying, there's no dog testing. This is rubbish. But it was it was really sustained in the media that we were trying to kill dogs. And the prime minister sort of came on the news saying, oh, I can't in all conscious um, 
allow drugs to be tested on small furry animals. This is the guy that was putting all these poisons all the way through the forest to kill the possums. And then bang, that was it. The laws got changed so that you're allowed to create a new drug and do safety testing, but you're not allowed to use animal studies to prove that it's safe. And then everything I was doing got made illegal and then every department suddenly turned on me and audited me and um, someone was brought in to try to take me out and so they, they bring in tax guys and they look at every transaction you've ever made in your life and go back and just get all your employees to turn on you and do all this stuff and that's and that's when I realised that um that, that just lobbying government's not really good enough because governments aren't really in control it's whoever's paying for their elections and paying the money that's who's in control you don't yeah. need to just find it I was trying to find a solution that would work for the general public and for government and I failed to take into account that we need a solution that works for the public and the government and the people that have got all the money. Mm. They need to keep making money. Mm. Of course. Of course. How naive of you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was. You just learn these things as you go, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Can you tell me about the day that you lost your house? Um, uh, I don't It was extremely traumatic having some, um, having a family and, and, um, having having your uh, you know your home and stuff taken off you and losing everything and having to my lawyers telling me um, you haven't broken any laws you haven't done anything wrong but you need to take your family out of this country immediately go or you will be in jail we'll get you out eventually but it's going to take a long time and you're going to be arguing from a cell and you're not going to be seeing your children much and um. You know, the lawyer said, you know, sometimes life gives you the option between, um, you know, a turd roll and a shit sandwich, and that's your day to day. Mm. <laughs> <I said. laughs> so, what, so, what did you do? Um, I, yeah, I said, to, um, said to my wife, you can choose anywhere you want in the world, hun. Let's just go. And um, so we we went to Thailand. We relocated to Thailand. So it was going to be warm, and the people there are kind of not so judgmental and. Uh, yeah, and went went to live in Chiang Mai. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people who hear this story, and I know that you're framing this story very much through a lens of harm minimization. That was your motivation. There's totally. going to be a few people who listen to this show and go, yeah, Matt, yeah, like, get your hand off it. Like, you made a lot of money, you bankrolled your career as a rock star, you had a good time, and that was your true motivation. I just, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really fair comment. Um, and um, totally, yeah, I'm a I'm a human being, and um, I went through that experience. I th I think this. I think that for the first kind of um eight or nine years, I was on track, and then the gravity of gold, if you like, um, you know, getting into the dragon's chamber and seeing it, it does, you know, um. It just kind of distracted me from my true purpose for a while, and mm. um, but like for those, you know, for those first few years, I wasn't, I wasn't making the money. I wasn't paying, getting my rent paid, or, or, or so on. When well, I made some money, totally, and we did a lot of good things for a lot of good people. Um, but yeah, it was a lot. Some, you know, there was some midlife crisis as well. I think everybody's entitled to one midlife crisis. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait for mine. I'm going to, I already, I already know which car I'm going to buy. Um, yeah. I mean, you took on a real steampunk aesthetic. I think that's really cool. Um, can you tell me, can you tell me about Starboy? Cause I mean, when we met up, when we were shooting that documentary, you know, we spent a lot of time shooting a video clip for, uh, for you as, as Starboy. And I, to this day, I think it was one of my favorite ever experiences when I was at Vice. Yeah, yeah. Vice should really um, release that video clip. I'd love to see it because they did say that they were going to make me a rock video. Yeah. Uh, Vice has said a lot of things <laughs> like that. <laughs> That's typical. I mean, you know, they're bankrupt now, <laughs> but uh, they've got a lot of unfinished projects in the vault, yours amongst them. Uh, was it the, the rock star dream that you'd always had? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, my dream, I was just feeling yuck about being the 
guy that makes and sells drugs for a living, I thought um, what I'd much rather do is big theatrical shows where you don't need to take any drugs, where the trip happens all around you and you don't need to imbibe anything. And um, so we started doing that and we've carried on with immersive theatrical experience parties mm-hmm. and so on. It's about let's do something, let's just use creativity. I mean, the difference between us and the animals is that we have creativity. We're able to have a thought that no one's ever had before. Mm. Yeah, so I did have a lot of those experiences. The rock star dream, I played in front of massive crowds and, you know, danced between flamethrowers and um, and just blew audiences away with shows where there's just something else crazy going on all the time, lasers and fire mm. and aliens and zombies and whatever else. Just to um, just so that when you play at a festival, people think, well, I don't know what the hell that thing from New Zealand was, but I'll go see it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so after the New Zealand government kind of tore down a lot of what you'd built, and it, it sounds like you had to go to Thailand and recreate your life. Um, tell me about that process and, and what's happening for you at the moment. Okay, yeah. And so I got there and um, and was traumatized. I'd lost my sort of self-esteem and, and all that all that kind of thing. And, and, and um, so I actually went and thought, well, let's, let's have a look and see what spirituality looks like here. Um, and went into um, Buddhist monasteries and so on and just did Vipassanas where you just sit in silence and listen to your breathing for days on end. And um, and as thoughts come up, you process them. And so through that, process trauma and because um, um, I, I was feeling pretty rotten about who I was as a person after being involved in that industry as well, being a corporate lobbyist for, for that was really yuck. And so I just I just thought, have I, am I, have I really lived my best life? And, and then gradually felt that um, that my that my job wasn't finished and that I had more to do and felt that I was going to get led back to New Zealand uh, which was scary I went we went and lived so I'd been spending I'd spent you know 20 years building a pharmaceutical company and as COVID was happening recognized that the interventions that were going to be used were probably going to you know could potentially hurt quite a lot of people and we needed some alternatives and there's going to need to be quite a lot of mopping up afterwards and so I started working on that on um, natural solutions for people that um, when they got an infection or an injection they didn't recover quite as well as the other people uh, finding solutions for that for long COVID vaccine injury and um and helping, which is an, which is almost as unpopular as um, trying to find drug alternatives, to be honest. Um, mm. But I'm quite used to um, flack, so <laughs> that's yeah. what I did. Okay, all right. I I really have uh, two questions more for you. Yeah. Um, so the first the first is, what are you excited about right now? What are you working on? Well, as I say, I mean, right now the world is um, facing. Um, epidemics, levels of mental health issues, uh, trauma-related illness, and the tools in the toolbox for trauma are drugs which shut down emotional processing. If everyone in the world's on the medicines that we've got for trauma, then no one's going to be able to do anything. The only drugs that are showing promise for trauma are the psychoactive drugs, your LSD, ketamine, MDMA, these sorts of things. Mm. Um, And what's great about them is that instead of going on the drug for years on end, you take it once or twice with a session and bang, you can do the work that used to take 10 years. And so through psychoactive drugs, um, if done right, they can rapidly address the trauma-related illnesses the world needs. And um, the only country in the world that's got purpose-built legislation for the development and deployment of psychoactive drugs is New Zealand. And so I've, I'm sort of now realizing that what I established was a building platform um, on a piece of land in New Zealand with this regulatory system, and no one's used it for 10 years, and, so, and, I, and I know it inside out. And so I'm now working on using that building platform to convince my country again that, um, that we were ahead of our time before, but now is the moment for us to rise up, and that the onus is on us to lead in this area of psychoactive drug development, not for people to get high, but for people that need to process trauma and get better and um, that it needs to come. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that leads me to my last question. And that is that it feels to me like you've spent the bulk of your career battling essentially the war on drugs that began in the, the 1950s and the 60s in the US and advocating for a much more progressive approach to the human desire to step out of our own brains for a few hours. Is it going to work? Or is there just an element of prudishness that's entrenched in in society and you're sort of swimming against the current? 
I did spend a lot of my time fighting and resisting war on drugs. Because war on drugs is essentially a war on... When we decided that someone using a psychoactive product that changes the way they think or feel is a deviant behavior, that was, that was an error. In fact, every civilization back to the dawn of time have used substances. Because as humans, this is what we do. We find tools. And we need to change gear from work mode into play mode, into mating mode, into hooking up with another person mode, um, into introspection mode, and into processing my emotions mode. And we need tools for that. And the tools that we have co-evolved with over millions of years are these things which pop up out of the ground the mushrooms and the cacti and these products and we've had a t- taboo against that and part of that has been religion and um, and trying to control and homologate other cultures as you know as colonists have spread around the world to force a certain religious view and saying well that plant's evil because it's because it's the devil hey that's 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 not good thinking and so what we're doing is not saying let's have a new way of thinking we're going back to the original way of thinking of that nature is here and is an ally and we have all of these plants and we have all of these um, all of these tools which help us to process. So let's use them and um, simply stop thinking the other way. Okay. I think the way that you frame drugs and their role in society is, is really unique. I haven't heard that kind of mix of anthropology and, and history with pharmacology. It's, mm. it's interesting. Okay, very last question. Mm-hmm. What, what have you learned Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it's a tricky one. What have I learned? What have I? I mean, some aspects I've learned that just just trying to work with, like I'd said, just trying to work with governments is not necessarily the way forward. Um, working with the community um, is the way forward. Yeah, just to just to continually shoot for the stars. And um, these days, I just really love to meet people and to look into the eyes of every other person that I see and to see that light and to see that soul. And um, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. where I'm at now. Yeah. No, 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 I love that. I love that. And Matt, I've really enjoyed spending this conversation uh, looking at you, looking, uh, looking into your light, hearing your story. This has been fascinating. This has been really interesting. And um, I can't thank you enough. Okay, thanks, Julian. I really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you're thinking, hey, I've got a story that's uh, that's pretty cool, something that could work for this show, you know, something interesting but surprising, a little bit unique, please get in touch, hit me up. I'm always looking for story suggestions or feedback or, you know, whatever you got. I'm Julian Morgans on Instagram and Morgans Julian on x and you know what we'd love you to follow the show you know the the follow button on whatever your podcast app is just press that we'll be eternally grateful and if you're on apple podcasts please leave us a review just a just a simple five stars should do it you don't even have to overthink it today's episode was produced by rachel tuffery it was edited and mixed by nicholas feliciano jimmy saunders did our theme music our cover art is by naomi lee beverage And this whole thing has been a super real production. Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening is available on Amazon Music for all the music plus top podcasts included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Start listening by downloading the Amazon Music app for free or go to amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads.